Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone there. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the MD of Bighorn, Alberta, Reeve Lisa Rosevold. But before we dive into our interview, 2024 is right around the corner. And for the month of December, we are running an exclusive 2024 New Year special subscription. For just $20.24 every three months during 2024, immerse yourself in a year of exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes access to great content we have in store for you in 2024. Ready to be part of the national conversation around municipalities and experience the magic of the cross-border interviews? Simply head over to our cross-border interviews website and click the support the show link now to subscribe to our quarterly holiday special and make your first quarterly donation today. Now, on to our interview. Reeve, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. I want to start with a basic question, but it's a general question. I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no <laughs> exception. So Lisa, where does your sense of duty to serve your community come from? You know what? It's a, a great question. I get asked it lots, and I have lots of different reasons. <laughs> um, but I think uh, the the big picture is I just like helping people. Um, and uh, that, I guess, goes back to my childhood and watching my parents. Um, I grew up in Ontario in a in the country out there, as we where, said. Where, where, where in Ontario? Got to know. I'm an Ontario boy, too. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Bradford, Ontario. So it's about an hour north of Toronto. I know right it on the well. 400 highway. <laughs> so um, continue. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. So uh, my parents, um, they both had their own businesses, but they gave back to the community, to the chamber of commerce and coaching baseball and helping with our ski racing programs and um, different, different kind of initiatives like that. And, uh, can, I, can I ask the general follow-up question here? How does yeah. someone from Bradford, Ontario, become the Reeve of Big, the uh, Municipal District of Bighorn, Alberta? <laughs> well, that's where it gets more complicated <laughs> and lovely. I, I think <laughs> I I love complicated stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. How much time do you have? Um. So I guess uh, once I graduated from university, I went to Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, and I did an earth science degree with an emphasis in polar regions. Um, and while I was doing that degree, I had a really unique experience in a job up in the high Arctic, working at a fishing lodge. And while I was working there, one of my managers that I, I had worked with um, told me about a uh, company she worked at in uh, in the Banff area called CMH Canadian Mountain Holidays. Um, it was a heli skiing uh, gig. <laughs> so essentially, as soon as I graduated from university, I packed up uh, a backpack and my skis and came out to the Bow Valley. Um, stayed in stayed in a friend's basement on an air mattress. <laughs> And uh, worked at the Heli Ski Lodge, just doing their lodge lodge staff stuff, like cleaning rooms and uh, doing the laundry, that kind of stuff, prepping prepping lunch. So um, from there, <laughs> uh, if I back up a little bit, when I was working at that fishing lodge in the Arctic, I actually met my husband up there, and he happened to live in Canmore. So it all all the stars kind of aligned i had this job lined up before i met my husband and i was already coming to the bow valley and then i met my husband and everything kind of just rolled into place and uh what was that was 20 or 2005 so, so i've been here ever since <laughs> so 2005 you moved to bighorn 2007 i moved to Can Canmore. sorry i moved to canmore 
And then in 20, 2018, I moved to the MD of Bighorn. Okay. So I I want to talk about that first election because you yeah. put your name forward. There is a vacancy because I, I tried to find some information on Ward 2, which you represent. Uh, there was a counselor, but I'm assuming she didn't stand for re-election. And then you decide to put your name forward, correct? Or how does this work out where <laughs> your name gets on the ballot? Because in your opening statement so far it doesn't seem like municipal politics would have been a uh fit for you it would have been maybe provincial or maybe even federal politics being sort of with the environmental sciences what was it about <laughs> municipal that drew you in in 2000 from what i understand 2017 yeah um so essentially um well canmore at the time when i lived there uh they have a program uh that um well, Councillor McCallum, who you talked to a couple of weeks ago, touched on it. Um, they have a, a program there uh, through perpetually affordable housing um, that my husband and I applied for, and we were able to secure a home through that program. And that home actually really allowed us to be, a, it was a stepping stone for us to be able to stay in the Bow Valley. As you're probably aware, it's incredibly expensive to live here. And that gave us just a little bit more time and allowed us to build a little bit of equity to be able to buy the home that we have right now. And essentially what initiated the move from Canmore to the MD of Bighorn was the land use bylaws. So the land use bylaws in the MD of Bighorn allowed for us to easily have a suite in our home, uh, which became an income helper. And my husband and I spent quite a few years looking in the Canmore area for that income helper or more sorry mortgage helper um type of property uh to buy but there wasn't really anything that uh would fit would fit the criteria that we were looking for and they were all already very expensive and most of them needed renovations so um the opportunity came around I live in a pretty brand new community. A developer started developing this in uh, 2016, I believe. I think I was the very first lot that was bought or sold in in Dead Man's Flats. Um, So I guess going from Canmore to the MD of Bighorn was a big step uh, that led me (laughs) to where I am today. But then also um leading up to leading up to that move I volunteered a lot um in the community of Canmore and through those various volunteer roles I actually ended up volunteering with uh, a past MLA campaign um so I helped him with his campaign uh and went to campaign college in Edmonton with him and a, and a small team And then uh, he was successful in his run as MLA. And then soon after that, the previous uh, Canmore mayor asked me to be his campaign manager uh, for his mayoral run, um, which he he actually did uh, four years later. But then that's when I had to say, I think I'm going to be running in my election, (laughs) so I can't help you. But... um, I had a lot of support from uh, from the public. Uh, I had only lived in Dead Man's Flats uh, for six months and like 15 days. And the minimum amount of time to live in your area to, to be successful with your nomination is six months. So I, I just squeaked in and I was running against an incumbent who had served two terms already. And uh, so it was a race. So uh, while we can stick on the election, I want to talk about your time on council for a few minutes, if that's Mm -hmm. okay. And I want to start with sort of a big question because six years in office, you're just past your sixth sixth year in office, going back to that first election where you ran and you were successful. You've had to make some pretty tough choices around that council table, I'm assuming. And you you know that personally yourself because you've been there. 
How do you make those decisions in a community like Bighorn, which is going through so many big issues right now with affordability, with infrastructure, with housing? How do you see your role as counselor and as Reeve now in making sure those issues impact the majority of the residents positively while not impacting them negatively? It's tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have only 1,598 people and we are nearly 4,000 square kilometers. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, you're, you're only, you're that small. I'm not saying small, like, oh my God, but like, I thought it was a lot more. I thought you had. No, but we are, we are also the 11th fastest growing municipality in Alberta right now. So, <laughs> which is hard to put those two numbers together and for it to make sense, but yeah, but that is indeed the case. Um, and uh, I guess uh, where the challenge comes in is about 90% of our population lives within the Bow Corridor. So maybe about seven square kilometers of those 3,000. <laughs> um, and then the rest are in the ranch lands. So there, and there's very different needs almost for every hamlet. In um, Harvey Heights, it's a, it used to be a summer village. Uh, there's no sidewalks, no streetlights very like kind of like cottage country feel. Uh, Harvey Heights has a commercial uh, highway district with hotel rooms and hotel suites. And then Dead Man's Flats is, uh, has one small residential condo. And then what is now the new part of Dead Man's Flats is 80 single family homes, and, uh, more townhouses and an industrial area. And, in a, and a growing uh, highway commercial uh, zone as well. And then um, Exha has uh, the industry. They have uh, the community there that has been established the longest in the MD of Acorn. And then we also have uh, a new development that is proceeding there with more residential units. Um, I'm not sure if you're frozen. No, testing oh. one, two, three. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I'll cut this out. Yeah. Okay. okay. I apologize. Uh, I... Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lactis Arcs is another community that is uh, cottage country esque with no streetlights and no sidewalks. And each one of, and then we also have Benchlands, which is a small community in our Ranchlands area. So, as you can imagine, each uh, hamlet has very different needs and wants. Some of them are uh, saying we would like like a whole bunch of different things. Um, and other areas are saying we do not want anything to change. Uh, in fact, if there's a way to, to help less people from coming into the community, it would get better. So it is a really hard balance to find when, when we've got so much of the population, probably half saying they want more more recreation, more uh, more homes being built, those types of things, and then the other half saying saying kind of the opposite. But um, I think where I try to go and before I make big decisions is really really start to listen to the public, or not start, but ask those questions that are coming up to the public. Uh, I show people... up to all the community. Oh, sorry. Are, Go ahead. No worries. Uh, are people willing to give their feedback in uh, Bighorn? Because one thing I hear from municipal leaders across Canada is there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics. You don't see a large amount of people attending council meetings unless there's a contentious <laughs> issue. Even then, it's often not likely. Um, for you, when you want people to give their feedback, are they willing to pick up the phone and call you or stop you at a grocery <laughs> store if they see you? Yeah, um, I think we're actually pretty good in that category. <laughs> um, like, we don't have too many uh, members of the public coming to our meetings, but we do have a lot of engagement. We just recently did a community services uh, master plan, and our consultant said we had 33% of our population respond to a survey. And they said that's the most they've ever had. Uh, from any other municipality they've done this this work with. So 
And then we just were working on our municipal development plan right now. We did six open houses and I think almost 200 people came to those open houses. Um, so I think we have a very engaged uh, population um, and that might also be because they see the the growth potential and the pressures of development on our area right now. And uh, I think they're really making wanting to make sure that their voices are heard. So, and I try to go to all of those. So, I, and I also go to community association meetings um, all the time. So I'm hearing from each individual Hamlet. And then every time we do, a survey, um, I have, since I've been on council, I've been making sure that the survey results are um, quartered off uh, by Hamlet so that we can make sure that we're trying our best to uh, deliver on what each area would like. Um, our, one of our, our quotes is we're a, a community of unique communities. And uh, that is how I would love to stay. Um, but it is challenging. <laughs> so um, there's a lot to unpack there. And I want to start with this. Um, you talk about the individual communities. You, you just use the words, we're a community of unique communities. But when you're at the council table, this is not a dead man's flat budget. This is not a bench lands budget. This is not even a ranch lands budget. This is a bighorn budget. So yeah. you 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 know, and I'm assuming you have been quite aware of this, that at the end of the day, some communities are not going to get what they want. And I'm not going to sort of poke the poke the proverbial bear here, but I'm going to have to a little bit. How do you make decisions on the best of the community while trying to still keep in mind the individual unique communities within it? Because when you're elected and sworn in, you're not sworn in as a dead dead man's flat counselor. You're sworn in as a bighorn counselor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, um, <laughs> I think does, the, does it get the best... easier? Does it get easier? Because <laughs> after six years, I'm assuming you've been able to find that balance of being able to say, unfortunately, it's going to have to be this way because it it's going to affect more people than just your area. Yeah. I, I think the areas have actually been fairly well um, kind of protected with their own land use bylaws. And we've been able to use that to help keep the areas as unique as they are. So um, that has been really helpful. Like the house I own in Dead Man's Flats, I, I could not build it in Lactis Arcs or Harvey Heights, but I could have built it in Exshaw. So uh, each each hamlet has very unique land use bylaws, and now, that now is that because of the it. area that you're in, or is that just because of the the way that the community was set up? Because for those who are listening to this outside of Alberta, for those who don't know where Bighorn is, um, it is basically on the like literally Banff. Bighorn, you are literally side by side. You have Canmore in there as well. So you have federal, provincial sort of regulations that you have to deal with as well. And I can imagine that is challenging when dealing with sort of the complexities of municipal issues that are facing your community. Oh, totally. <laughs> we're constantly <laughs> we're constantly juggling who are we supposed to talk to with this one? <laughs> Uh, which ministry, uh, so it, there's a constant juggle with with uh, trying to work through some of those challenges uh, and considering how big we are, we've got, um, we're, we're, as you mentioned, neighbors to Canmore, Banff National Park, Kananaskis, um, and then we go all the way up to almost sundry uh, Rocky Mountain House into the panther area and num num oh my goodness i can never say that let's just pass over that one <laughs> i will cut that yeah, part no, out <laughs> I, yeah i got it yaha tinda so anyone that rides a horse in alberta will know where yaha tinda is so that is just on our borders as well um so we have a lot of uh of area to i guess steward the land where 
where we don't have anybody living. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, that has been a challenge. And that's something we've actually been working quite aggressively on with the provincial government over the last year is the care and management of, of the ghost area. Um, so that would be like the crown lands essentially in between uh, Cochrane and, and Banff National Park and uh, sort of along the 22. Um, I am cautious of time here. And as we're talking about some issues, I want to sort of go into segment two here, if you don't mind. And before I do yeah. that, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the Reeve and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the Reeve's opinion and her opinion alone. <laughs> I don't know why, but we still, even after a year of doing this, still get email. <laughs> <laughs> so Reeve, in your opinion what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing bighorn today um well development pressures so we're in that economic corridor tourism corridor of alberta um if there's five million people going to banff every year that means there's five million people driving through the MD of Bighorn to get there. Um, so along with along with that become development pressures along the Trans-Canada. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, areas that have been, uh, land that has been sort of sat on and stagnant for, for a while. Now, all of a sudden, all of it, everybody's trying to develop all at the same time. So, um, so those development pressures for sure. And then you along have developers with knocking on your door right now? Yes. We do. I guess yeah. that's a good thing, bad thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's good and bad. Like when I think our development permits or building permits are up eight hundred percent over the last five years. So uh, I'm not trying to laugh <laughs> at that. Just that's a staggering number, but yeah. it's the reality you're facing. Yeah it's it's unbelievable um so we've got almost like a, a different issue than a lot of alberta right now where uh people are showing up at at our door and we're just saying like hold on <laughs> we need to finish the area structure plan before you can start doing that or um because there hadn't been any any development pressures in those areas but now all of a sudden it's they're coming fast and furious. So, um, which yeah, like you said, is good and bad, but at the same time, like we need to be organized administratively and like ready to take on all those uh, developments and um, our, our planning and development department has been <laughs> incredibly busy, but then so have our uh, operations and in infrastructure departments trying to keep up with the growth that's happened. Um, um, and we have, a, we also have a new council. Uh, I'm the only person that stayed on from the last term. So it's a fairly pretty new council. And then we've also had two by-elections this term. <laughs> um, so we're, we're constantly changing, but we've had uh, uh, support to, uh, I guess, well, we did a salary review for our staff and we've had, uh, we've given our staff uh, a raise essentially, hoping that that'll help us with some uh, retention and then help us with some recruitment uh, issues that we've had in the past two years. So uh, yeah, so, big. <laughs> so there's, big it seems like there's a few challenges that your community is facing right now. And I, I, I don't wanna sort of only talk about the challenges because I, I like talking about the, the accomplishments. So I want to ask the the sort of the flip question to the issues question, and that is, what does Bighorn do right? What is the thing that you go to RMA and you say, you know what, guys, you might be doing it good. The MD of Bighorn's doing it better. What in in the <laughs> municipal realm is Bighorn getting right right now? Um, so I think two things. Uh, first, uh, we have fifty four on-call volunteer firefighters that work out of three different halls in the MD of Bighorn. Oh. Um, 
they do a phenomenal job of protecting uh, not only our our residents and ratepayers, but uh, the traveling public. Um, and that's high, highway motor vote H or <laughs> highway motor vehicle collisions. I've only got acronyms dancing around in my head. I'm trying to not use them. <laughs> For those who are um, listening, if you need to figure them out, just Google them. Okay. You might come up with yeah. the, the wrong answer, but just Google them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, between those three fire halls, we're and we're constantly supporting uh those fire crews with more training and more equipment. Uh we're advocating to the province right now to try and get some funding sources for emergency calls that are happening on Crown Land. Um, we're doing quite a lot of them um, with all the, the surge in tourism in, in our area. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of serious accidents because people can uh, use their OHVs and uh, mountain bike and rock climb and all that fun stuff uh, can be dangerous. So uh, a huge shout out to our firefighters um, for for stepping up into that role. And uh and we've been doing pretty good at recruiting uh, new firefighters as well. So um, I would say that is definitely one of our strengths. And then another strength right now is uh, we just completed a governance audit with uh, Mr. George Cuff and <laughs> Donald. Oh, Georgie. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was really good. Uh, it kind of uh, created like a, a reset for us. Uh, we were a new council. Uh, we were a much younger council. Um, uh, I was the only person that had been a councillor before. So we kind of took that audit. We've got 43 recommendations. We're working through most of them and we've, we've actually accomplished a, a large number of them. Some of them are ongoing uh, recommendations that will last forever. But um, that sort of has led us in a path of like focusing on good governance um, first. And then um, and in good governance, uh, we also, it also identifies like good engagement with, with the public, good communication, good um, uh, respectful relationships between council and administration and, um, we're, for the first time this year, since I've been on council, we have a CAO council covenant uh, that we have both signed. And it's essentially like a marriage agreement <laughs> um, where it's like, we we will do this and councillors will do this and the CAO will do this. Um, and it's just uh, a mutual understanding of what our relationship is, is going to look like and how we're going to move forward together. So um, I think... I uh, changing the culture of of the municipality and uh building trust and i i see that as a big as a big strength so uh I, i'm so happy that you came on my show first off we're still going to talk about my favorite subjects in two seconds but i want to just tell a quick <laughs> little story here um and i know i'm cautious of time so hopefully you have an extra about 10 minutes that we can chat for yeah, a little bit longer i do um i Earlier this summer, I was in uh, Bighorn. I was doing a tour, and I enjoy visiting municipal town halls. Yes, I'm that type of municipal nerd, <laughs> where I like to see the municipal halls up close and personal. Now, I'd never been to Bighorn. I'd been through it, as many people probably have, but I actually went off the beaten path, and I went into your community, and I stopped at your town hall. And I will say this on the record for anyone who's listening – if you want to see what good administration staff is, go visit Bighorn. Because I Aww. walked into that town hall and they didn't know me from Adam and they didn't even need to acknowledge me because I was just in there just to see what it's all about. They yeah. introduced themselves. They asked if everything was okay. And I asked them a few questions and they were very helpful, very informative. And they, yes, of course, for those who listen to me, I, they, you know that I enjoy a lapel pin or two. So I asked for a lapel <laughs> pin and they were so happy to graciously donate one to me <laughs> for my yeah. trip. So I'm just telling you, as a, as a tourist to your community, you have some amazing administrative staff at your city hall or town hall. So just pass that along to your administration, your CEO, because I think you guys do a wonderful job there. 
Oh, that's awesome to hear. Thank you so much. <laughs> no I will worries. for sure pass that on. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so um, as I said, and you sort of mentioned it, tour uh the surge in tourism is happening in Bighorn. And it is a topic oh. that I love to talk about, particularly with municipal leaders. So yeah. as you have, I'm assuming there are some things that people know about in Bighorn. You talked about some of the horse riders who would know some areas that they'd go to. But what mm. are the hidden gems in your community? What are the things that don't often get the sort of the big play that you want to say, if you come to Bighorn, you have to see this? Um... Interesting. Um, one of the hidden gems, you know what? And it's I'm gonna confess, it's so hidden. I have actually never been to it, <laughs> but it is on my list. I have a lot of BMT of Big Corn on my list. Um, but um, around Lactis Arcs, there is what is called the Heart Creek Bunker. Have you heard of this? I have not. This is this. I I'm writing it down. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So this was um, a bunker that was commissioned by the federal government during the Civil War. Uh, and they were looking for an area to hide all of the most important documents um, in case in case things went sideways. Um, so this bunker is a cave that you can still get into and access today um, that was essentially created to be a hiding place uh, for important government documents. Um, once they finished building it, they realized the moisture content um, was a little too bit too high for for these important documents, and uh, it never ended up getting used as it was intended. But um, it's quite easy to access right off of the Trans Canada Highway near the Heart Creek Trailhead. And okay. If you Google it, you will find lots of information on it. Oh, I will be because, uh, as you just said, that I, I recently had a uh, counselor from Canmore on the show, and I said that my mother is coming out. Actually, this episode airs the day my mother arrives from Ontario, and we're oh, going cool. out to Banff. So, <laughs> hope there you go. Hopefully, she likes a big hike in her future <laughs> while she's out here. Yeah, um, it's actually not too big of a hike. It's easy. It's kind of easy access, which is why I'm I'm shocked I haven't been. But like my kids have been there for birthday parties, like when they were little kids and uh, they can have campfires in there and stuff. But I don't know if those campfires are allowed anymore, but <laughs> they were, uh, they had to have them back in the day. But, um, and then I think just our ghost, the whole ghost area is such a gem. Uh, Do you mind me asking why it's Alberta. called the ghost area? It's the ghost conservation area. That's, that's it's just uh, the name the, of it like go, there's no like secret haunt ghost story river. about <laughs> no okay. uh ghost river uh flows through it um so it, that's i guess where in the name comes from and the ghost uh uh the oh my goodness the the waterhead of the ghost is lake minnewanka in banff national park so the ghost flows down from uh there and comes into the bow river so uh, that whole ghost area uh, borders the Ghost River, and it is—it's just a beautiful like sight to behold. Um, I kind so, of uh, equal it to like Kananaskis before it was a provincial park. <laughs> oh wow! Um, yeah. So I'm gonna sort of flip the question a little bit. Where do you go? Where do you go in Bighorn to? get away from it all <laughs> because i assuming after six years you have to have that spot where you can just go and decompress and i'm assuming right. it's probably like every other municipal leader i've ever chatted to and it's usually their house <laughs> um so i have a very ontario-esque home that we built here uh with a big 600 square foot deck that i love to hang out on um, but uh, that deck overlooks Grotto Mountain, Pigeon Mountain, the back of the Three Sisters. Um, it's very picturesque and quite peaceful. And then um, I, I personally, I just love walking around Dead Man's Flats uh, where I live. Uh, the Bow River is only 200 meters from my home uh, through a forest. So it's, 
it's a beautiful spot to hang out. We've got a couple secret beaches that are very hard to find. So don't you all go show up and look, come looking for them. <laughs> it's, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a really nice place to hang out. And it's so nice that the world hasn't necessarily found a, found those places yet because uh, as you I'm sure heard like uh, a lot of the Bow Valley like as a local I used to go to Moraine Lake uh, a couple times every summer or Lake Louise or Grassy Lakes and uh, all of those now have paid parking you need a bus to get to Mor Moraine Lake you can't even drive there anymore so uh, I have heard from a lot of locals that they're they're feeling like it's really hard to connect with those areas that they've uh, been able to call home for so long and uh, making sure that our special spots are still uh, accessible to our public is, is really important to me. So. So I, oh, I, I have one last question before I let you go. Yeah. And it's the million dollar question that I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on the show. <laughs> so you're no exception to this question. And I think it's the important question. Because I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it. It's just always great to hear them answer it. In your opinion, Lisa, what makes the municipal district of Bighorn such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? <laughs> hmm. I'm going to kind of divide it into two parts. So in our Do book it. corridor, in our book corridor, I would say like the proximity to the mountains um one thing that I always loved um well I kind of I kind of preached this and then I I lived it was I always felt like the most important thing one of the most important things and this is me coming fresh out of university was to live where you want to wake up every day and the job will find you after and the people of this of this area they all want to live here um, and I, it's something you don't see everywhere you travel <laughs> or everywhere I've been, there's, there's people that you come across where they're like, oh man, it sure would be nice to get out of this place. Um, but the difference of where we live, uh, is that everybody's here because they want to be here. And that passion for this area is what makes the communities unique. It's what uh, brings the energy to to the communities. It's where I get my energy. I know that the people I'm representing are sacrificing a lot and working really hard to be able to live live here. And uh, it's it's what helps me do what I do every day. Um, and then in our ranch lands area, um, a, there's a lot of like fourth, fifth generation ranchers out there. Uh, and their stories are much different than those in the Bow Valley, where in the Bow Valley, we've, a lot of us have immigrated here from other parts of Canada. And then in the ranch lands, uh, those are areas that have been homesteads for generations and trying to help, um, identify those areas and figure out ways to help protect them and uh, make sure that those homesteads are there for future generations should those should they want that um, I think those the desire to govern like that is uh, is really important and what keeps our areas each so unique, a community of unique communities. <laughs> um, Reeve, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know I said a half hour We're at the 40 minute mark now, so I do apologize <laughs> for running a little bit late, but I appreciate okay. your candor, your honesty, and uh, you willing to chat about the MD of Bighorn for a little bit. So thank you so much. And hopefully when I'm back out in the MD, we can go <laughs> grab a coffee or go go to the bunker together. And that way we can visit. Yeah, that would be together. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. 
Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your unwavering interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content you have come to expect from us. Now, we're thrilled that local leaders from coast to coast to coast in Canada are coming on the show to share their story with us, each with their own unique perspectives and experiences. So mark your calendars and keep those notifications on because there's a wealth of knowledge waiting for you just around the corner. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross-Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.